Has anybody heard of this psychologist named Abraham Maslow? Yeah. OK, you have before. Well, that's good. Um, Abraham Maslow developed this hierarchy of needs, right? And at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs are physiological needs and their safety needs. And the very top is this peak. In fact, they often call them peak experiences, you know, when you're really self-actualizing. Remember that? OK, so Maslow was the founder of humanistic psychology. He started developing this Maslow hierarchy of needs in the 1950s and 60s. This was perfect for that generation, for the baby boom generation who started thinking about, well, they're often called the me generation, aren't they? It's about self-actualization. It's about my own human potential. Viktor Frankl, who had gone through three concentration camps, psychotherapist, trained in Vienna with Freud, saw 90% of the people around him in those concentration camps murdered or starved or sick and died. And he, when he came out, he told Abraham Maslow, it's not about self-actualization. It's about something a little bit bigger than that. It's about self-transcendence. It's about doing something bigger than yourself. And you know what's cool about Abraham Maslow? This is in the later part of his life, and he's already super famous. He could have said, oh, yeah, right. He could have had a big argument and fight, a global fight with uh, Viktor Frankl. Instead, he said, you know what? You're actually right. I was wrong about this. Self-transcendence is bigger than self-actualization. He said, transcenders find it easier to transcend the ego, the self the identity, and to go beyond self-actualization. Let's talk about the ego for a second. I don't know if we've talked all that much today about the ego, but this is a really, really important factor, this ego thing. And I'm going to start with a boiling frog metaphor. Does anyone know about the boiling frog metaphor? OK, if you take a live frog and you just drop him in boiling water, the frog jumps out right away, right? But if you put the frog in cool water and just gradually, gradually increase the heat, the frog gets sleepy, kind of rolls over, and then he cooks, right? I love this metaphor. I don't care if it's a right metaphor, you know? I mean, uh, Johns Hopkins in the 1800s actually wrote an entire series of experimental research studies all about trying to boil frogs, and it's so disgusting, you don't want to read it. It's in my book, though, um, in the very back, in the notes. But the point is that what I love about this metaphor, it's so relevant to our national crises that we have. We have a crisis right now of obesity. We have a crisis that relates to climate change, don't we? And these are boiling frog problems because they only occur ever so gradually. We don't really notice them. We gain one pound a year on average as Americans. Do we notice that? No, not typically. 20 years from, late, from now, though, we go, oh, I can't see my toes, yeah. So it's really different then, suddenly. So these boiling frog problems are very, very gradual. Think about climate change, very gradual. Suddenly, we're cooked, though. So this is a super big issue. I was a boiling frog myself when my daughter Julia passed away four years ago. She was born healthy. She liked to say, I was a 10 out of 10. She was born in 1990. And then suddenly, at six months, she caught a chickenpox virus, which we all catch, by the way. All babies get chickenpox viruses. We know that. And uh, only every once in a while, in about 200 children in the whole world, that virus attacks your heart. And for her, she started losing weight. And then we were told she only has about 30 days to live. And so it turned out that her only hope was to get a heart transplant. And they had done very, very few heart transplants among children, just no more than 50 of them around the world. She ended up getting the first heart transplant in the southern part of the United States. I was a professor at the University of North Carolina at that time. And uh, when she got this heart, we decided we're going to live her life differently. We're going to live her life as if every single day of her life might be the last day of her life. We made a pact to do that. Not knowing. If she would die tomorrow, we'd go, OK, are we satisfied with the life we were, we were going to give her? By the way, this is nothing new. 2,000 years ago, literally 2,000 years ago, Seneca, a Stoic philosopher, would wake up every morning and say, I may die today. And he would actually focus and concentrate and contemplate his own death. And in doing so, he lived a much bigger life. That was the idea. 
So did Epictetus. So did Epicurus. So did Marcus Aurelius. If you ever want to read a wonderful book, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, short read, one of the most modern reads you'll ever find. And he talked about thinking about his own death every day. By the way, more recently, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, if each of us would contemplate our deaths at least once a day, we'd have a more peaceful world. Why are they talking about that in that way? Because typically, in our society, we don't want to think about death, do we? We either don't think about it, or we postpone, you know, we just we do something about death that's different. We just somehow block it out. Often we say, okay, let's have medical miracles that'll make us live forever, essentially. What if we did live forever? What would we do? Would we watch more Miley Cyrus twerking videos? Would we listen to more Cardassian sisters, what they're gonna do? I'm very serious because I see a growing nihilism in our society, a growing loss of purpose and meaning. By the way, this is nothing new. Emile Durkheim predicted it in 1888 when he wrote a book called Suicide. He said, as we lose our religions, as we modernize, as we move out of you know, small villages and move into big cities where we don't know each other and we start losing our family, we start losing our communities, we'll start killing ourselves. And sure enough, he was absolutely right. If you read his 1888 book, Suicide, you will find it unbelievably present. He understood what was going to happen. And sure enough, the highest suicide rates are found in the most modern countries, where there is the least amount of purpose and the greatest amount of nihilism. I would argue, therefore, that purpose may actually be a public health issue. I'm a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. We talk about smoking, and we talk about drinking, and a lot of other things, and, and uh, we talk about obesity. Maybe we should also be talking about purpose. But let's get back to this boiling frog just a little bit. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get back to the boiling frog. I want to stay on my daughter, because I still love her so much. Um, I just wanted to tell about the last days of her life, if that's all right. Um, we were in the Caribbean. She was in nursing school at the University of Michigan. And she, we brought her boyfriend with her um, down to the Caribbean during spring break. And we got them a suite on the beach together. And I know what you're thinking. Really? <laughs> um, and we did. She is 19 years old. And you know, I guess all I'd ask is that if you had a person who you were treating as if they may not live another day, how would you do this? And for me and for my wife, we said, we'll get them a suite on the beach. Because we wanted her to love and to be loved and to be cared for and to be intimate. We wanted all the things that we have gotten to do now in our lives. And by the way, this transferred to us, too. We started becoming more intimate. We loved each other more, as if every single day might be the last day of our lives. It was kind of a training exercise that was given to us by our own daughter. Three nights into the Caribbean uh, vacation, she turned to her boyfriend before they were going to bed, and she said, I am so happy, Brian, that I could die now. And then she did that night. And she never woke up. Brian told us this afterwards. Those are the last words to him. So when that happened, I kind of lost my own purpose and my own meaning. I ended up, we have a place out on Lake Michigan, uh, in northern Michigan. And I took my kayak out one morning. It's just a few months after Julia had passed away. And I started thinking about what I was going to do in my life. I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to kind of be productive anymore, be a human being anymore. I actually, and I, you know what, by the way, what I'm saying is nothing that's unique. If we went around the room, almost every single person in this room would have their own story about loss and some grief that they had to go through. This is nothing unique. And I'll bet that if you've gone through something like this, you went to a certain point where you said, I can continue the way I'm going, and if I do, I'll die, because I really don't care if I die or not. Or I'm going to need to change my life completely. And if I do change my life, I don't know where that's going to go. But maybe I have a chance to live. And it really was a crossroads. It was this experience that I literally had out on Lake Michigan, about a mile out in a kayak. And I was looking up as the sun was rising. I felt Julia in me. And she said, you know what, Dad? You need to get over this. And I didn't you know, get over it. It's not like get over it. It was more like you need to get over this. You need to get over your own ego. You need to think about other things, about other people, 
not simply about yourself and your own grief and your own loss. And that was, to me, that was an epiphany. By the way, I want to say, you, you've noticed some of these slides. I have a comic book illustrator who helped me with these from DC Comics. And I asked him to make myself look more handsome and thinner. <laughs> and he said, it's your book, dude, whatever. But I do want to tell you one thing about Julia. I asked him to draw Julia exactly the way she was. And she really was a beautiful person, a beautiful woman. And uh, so throughout the book, all the images of Julia are absolute photo accurate. Steve Jobs, knowing that he was going to die of pancreatic cancer in 2005, gave the commencement address to Stanford University. And what he said is amazing. Death is very likely the single best invention of life. Death is life's change agent. Why did he say that? Well, if you read Walter Isaacson's book about Steve Jobs, Steve told him, I don't expect to live past the age of 30. I, or I never did. I never expected to live past the age of 30. And so what did he do? He created Apple before the age of 30. And while he wasn't always the most pleasant person, one of the reasons he wasn't the most pleasant person to other people, although I know some people who knew him very directly and actually is quite pleasant to many people, his friends and family, but to many of the people he worked with, he drove them very hard. He drove himself very hard because he felt that he wasn't going to live very long. He had this urgency. He never thought life would just continue to extend, so he didn't really need to do all that much. He really saw that urgency of life. And as a result, he built Apple, and he continued to create, to make a ding in the universe. So let's get back to our boiling frog. Cigarette smoking is a boiling frog problem, too, because we start smoking cigarettes and then just we, you know, gradually get sicker. You know, it takes a long time before you start getting sick from cigarettes. But then, after a while, you're cooked, right? Here's an experiment. Typically, if you just give the, these warning labels on the back of cigarette packs to people who smoke, they go, yeah, that's not me. That's, you know, and so what do we do now? We try to up the ante. We try to scare people even more. So now the FDA is actually reviewing uh, warning labels on the back of cigarette packs that have dead people with zippers going down. It's disgusting. You know? So, oh, we haven't scared the crap out of people already. Let's scare them even more. Let's just keep upping the ante. Right? You see this with HIV ads on TV in New York City, in fact, and a lot of things that just really are disgusting because they've run out of ideas, right? Well, here's a little experiment. They, this was a control group where they just had people who smoked looking at these cigarette ads, and nobody was interested in quitting smoking. They just defended this. Then they had another group, and they said, write down your core values, the things that you care about the most. So this woman may say, I want to be a good mother. I want to be a good spouse. I want to be in control of my life. Turns out she's 40% more likely than to quit smoking. 40%. Now that is a huge amount, by the way. We've tried scaring people. We've given them skills programs, nicotine patches. That produces what? About a 15% improvement in quit rates. When we ask them simply to write down what their core values are, 40%. Unbelievable. And that's what I thought, unbelievable. And then the whole study was replicated. Now it's been replicated along with other behaviors over a dozen times, and it's consistent. When you start thinking about your core values, you end up changing your life. So I had to ask myself why. By the way, this is called self-affirmation. When you're affirming yourself, your true self, who are you really inside, inside this kind of castle wall that you have, that we might call an ego, who are you deeply inside? When you start thinking about that, you start affirming yourself. So I had to ask as a researcher, why? Why is this going on? Why does writing down your core values reduce defensiveness? And sure enough, in our own university, literally two blocks away, there is a researcher, a psychologist named Jennifer Crocker, who asked the same question. She literally wrote a study, why does writing about important values reduce defensiveness? And so I called her, and by the way, you know what, we, are, we, we live within our own egos too, they're called departments and schools, and really it's not easy to, to change that. So I called her and I said, Jenny, what's going on with this? And here's what she said. These studies in concert with previous research suggest that values affirmation reduces defensiveness by self-transcendence. 
That's fascinating to me. So let's talk about um, purpose in life. I asked Jenny to describe how she found this, what she found and how she found it. When they were looking at people who were writing down their core values, she asked people to just think out loud. Think out loud while you're writing about your core values. And what people started doing is saying things like love, compassion, things that were bigger than themselves. And they started thinking about their own purpose and meaning in their lives. I would say that a good definition of purpose in life is an overarching goal that's based on self-transcending values to which you're highly committed to and actively engaged in. Okay, in other words, it's like a meta goal. It's some larger goal than a typical goal. Let's say this was a swimming pool. We're all in the swimming pool and we're all at the edge of the pool. And I say, look, I'd like you to swim as many laps back and forth as you can. And maybe you could swim, some, you could swim 20 and some could swim one and some could swim 50, whatever. And then I said, okay, I want to set a goal with you. I'd like you to swim a mile. I'd like you to you know, swim 60 laps or whatever. You'd end up swimming more more laps. You may not hit your, you know, may not hit one mile, but you'd end up swimming more laps. That's what a purpose does. It is a meta goal. So you may not ever achieve this goal, and that's okay, actually. In fact, some of the best purposes in life are things that you may never be able to achieve, but you will end up achieving more as a result of having a strong purpose in your life. I want to talk about this idea of transcendence. Do we need a transcending purpose in our lives? because there are other kinds of purposes in our lives. And think about values kind of being the pillars of this bigger purpose in life. Just to clarify and kind of further define this, think about all of these pillars kind of shoring up this bigger purpose that we have. And you could have transcending values or different kind of values. This is a study looking at values. They call them aspirations here, but this is a study done at the University of Rochester with college seniors. Who has uh, kids who are in high school or college here. Anyone? Okay, a number of you. So this is maybe relevant to some of you. Um, the consequences of, of attaining intrinsic and extrinsic aspirations in post-college life. Here's what they did. They took a look at college students who were seniors and they asked them, what kind of values do you have? And by the way, all of us have a whole melange of different values, but they kind of broke people out into uh, college students who tended to have very extrinsic values, and these were things like money, fame, attractiveness, power. They could write about those and talk about those very easily. And then others said community, my relationships, personal growth. And then they followed these college students for two years. First of all, they found that the college students achieved their aspirations, were more likely to achieve their aspirations than not. So if you were into power and fame and wealth and attractiveness, you ended up being more likely than the other group to achieve those things. If you were more interested in personal growth and relationships and kindness and community, you were more likely to achieve those than the extrinsic group. Does that make sense? Okay, it turns out though that the intrinsic group had tremendous well-being, physical and mental well-being. They were very well adjusted. They had very low rates of depression, anxiety, and also physical illness two years later. The people with extrinsic aspirations or values or purpose, whatever you want to plug into that, ended up with far greater ill-being, both mental and physical, much greater rates of depression, anxiety, problems, and physical health problems. Here's another study. Jenny did this. Jenny Crocker, my new friend from psychology two blocks away. She started this study with 92 college students and with this statement to the students coming into this experiment. They said, God, you know, you filled out this information sheet all about yourself, but the other students in the group decided not to pick you for their group. Doesn't that make you sad? I mean, even thinking about it right now, we know that when you are not picked for something, and We've all been not picked for something, whether it's a soccer team or whether it's whatever, a sorority, whatever you feel bad, it threatens your ego, right? And when, that threat, when your ego is threatened like that, there are over a dozen years of research now that have shown that you eat more, that you drink more alcohol, you're more likely to abuse substances, you do all sorts of bad things, you become more sedentary, you smoke more cigarettes, all of those things. So when your ego is threatened, 
you start engaging in these poor health behaviors. So Jenny said, okay, let's see if we can mollify that a little bit. So she took 92 college students and told them that they weren't picked by these other students. And by the way, that was a total sham. Nobody did not not pick them. She just said that, okay? So she wanted to make them feel bad. And then she divided them into three different groups. And in the control group, she just said, oh, write down your daily routines, things like that. That was just a control condition. The second group, she said, write down values that are similar to, that relate to your interest in more power, in more wealth, in being more attractive, in prestige, things like that. You know, and all of us, by the way, I'm sure could do it. I know I could do it. Charlie Sheen may have an easier job doing that, but, you know, we all probably could write about this, and no student assigned to that group had any trouble writing about this. They didn't say, I'm stopping this study, I'm, you know, leaving. They all could write about this and elaborate on it. And then the third group, they said, write down your transcending, they didn't say transcending, they just said, write down how you relate to empathy or support or community or kindness, things like that, okay? So you see different kinds of values uh, affirmation suddenly? Before, all they were doing is just testing whether affirming your core values influence your behavior. That was nice, but then Jenny Crocker said, I wonder if transcending values are more important than enhancing values. In other words, is a value a value a value? Are some values more valuable than others? And here's the real kicker in this whole experiment. After they had written these down, they're all sitting, you know, a person is sitting in a room by themselves, and Jenny Crocker, the experimenter, walks in with a bowl of warm chocolate chip cookies and sets them down and says, oh, by the way, since you weren't picked for this other experiment, we have this other study, this second study, where we're testing the taste of these cookies. Would you mind being a part of this and signing a consent form to taste test these cookies? Oddly enough, 92 out of the 92 students said yes <laughs> and consented to this study. Nice. So they all did. Now you can guess what the outcome or what the real outcomes that we were interested in in this experiment, right? Can you guess? How many cookies did they eat, right? We know that if your ego is threatened, you're going to eat a lot of cookies, right? They didn't quite know that if their ego was threatened, they'd eat eight cookies. <laughs> and these cookies were big. So, you know, this, uh, eating eight cookies at one sitting, they're going, oh, I wasn't picked up, oh, like this. So that was amazing. The people who wrote down their Charlie Sheen values ate, I'm sorry to Charlie Sheen. I'm just joking, okay? <laughs> Don't sue me, Charlie. So um, if you wrote down your self-transcending values, he had about five cookies. And if you wrote down your self Trans uh, if you wrote down self-enhancing values, and if you wrote self-transcending tr values down, you ate three cookies on average. That's amazing, isn't it? These are statistically significant. This is not due to chance alone. That's pretty impressive to find something like that. In other words, transcending values seem to be more valuable to you in terms of your behavior and your behavior change. That's pretty cool. So let's look at purpose in life as being kind of this pinnacle a transcending purpose in life as being the pinnacle. Here are some studies that have looked at that. People who have a self-transcending purpose in life are 30% less likely to develop heart disease or a heart attack four years later. People with a self-transcending purpose are more likely to be able to manage their HbA1c, their diabetes, their blood sugar. People with a strong purpose in life are 30% less likely to develop stroke four years later. People with, okay, this is an amazing study. University of Chicago Rush Alzheimer's Center took seniors in senior centers and they asked them whether they had a purpose in life and the strength of that purpose in life. Then they followed them for seven years. During the seven years, they put people in MRI to study deterior, deterioration of the brain. They also didn't take anybody who was cognitively impaired in the beginning of this study, nobody. And they controlled statistically for their income for their education, and for everything else they could possibly statistically adjust for. So essentially, people tended to be the same at baseline. Only one difference. Some had a low purpose in life, some people had a high purpose in life. They followed people seven years later. They found that the people with a low purpose in life were 2.4 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. I'll repeat that. 
people with a low purpose in life compared to those with a high purpose in life were 2.4 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. This is not to blame victims of Alzheimer's disease by any means. We don't want anybody going, oh, you just had a low purpose in life, sorry. That is not the case here, but what is really true is that purpose in life seemed to be protective in this cohort study where they really statistically controlled for this. They also found that they live longer if you had a high purpose in life. But if you had a low purpose in life, you were much more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. What if you had a drug that did that? Well, first of all, if you did, if you're a pharma company and you built a drug like this, it would probably maybe prevent 30%. You know, it wouldn't be 2.4 times different. And there'd be six pages of contraindications. By the way, this may cause penile disruption or whatever. You know, they have all these different things. Remember, when you're looking at these ads, it's like, are you kidding? Um, so the only side effects I can see of having a strong purpose in life is that you may have more friends, you know, and be bothered, called more by your buddies to go out, you know. Uh, Middle-aged women who have a strong purpose in life have better sex, it turns out. Nice. So it's a lot. Of, this is awesome. I mean, this is like a magic drug. If we had a drug like this, if we could package it up, this would, I mean, this would be a blockbuster, wouldn't it? It would be in our drinking water, I would say. Um, and we know that people with a strong purpose in life live longer. What's interesting about that, though, is that the people who have a purpose in life are not that concerned about death other than the fact that they see an urgency in their life. And they think that they need to do a lot while they're here on this planet. That's what's so cool about this. One more study before I stop on the big study fest, but this is so important. Elizabeth Blackburn is a 2009 Nobel laureate in medicine. Amazing, University of California, San Francisco, awesome person. And she discovered telomeres. Telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes. You have shoelaces, right? And on the ends of your shoelaces, you have these plastic caps, right? What are those called? Does anyone know? Well, geez, usually most people don't know that. I just gave a talk in Milwaukee to 600 people. They didn't know what that was. Six. Really? New York Times crossword? Oh, sweet. OK. So anyway, these aglets are kind of like telomeres. Our telomeres are more like aglets. So our telomeres protect our chromosomes from fraying. And as our telomeres shorten, we start getting sick and we start dying. And that's what she discovered and won the Nobel Prize for. She also found that as people were more stressed in their lives, not just getting older, but as they got more stressed, and if certain populations got very stressed, they tended to have shorter telomeres as well, or you know, like cracked aglets. So she put people into a meditation program for three months. And she had another condition where she just had people in a waiting list control group for a meditation program. And she found, sure enough, as expected, compared to the weightless control group, that the meditators had longer telomeres and greater telomerase activation. Telomerase is the enzyme that activates the telomeres. Isn't that incredible? That meditation alone produced lengthening of telomeres. But then here's the kicker. She also asked about purpose in life over time. And what she found is that the meditators, compared to the non-meditators, were developing a much stronger self-transcending purpose in life. And as they built this stronger purpose in life, it was the purpose and not the meditation they found that actually contributed to the tel uh, telomere lengthening and the telomerase activity. That makes sense to people? This is amazing. This is an incredible study because it's literally going down to the DNA level from a highly philosophical construct that medical people think, really, purpose? Why should we study that? Because of this. And why shouldn't we? So my own purpose is to help other people find a purpose. By the way, that was Viktor Frankl's purpose as well when he was asked. My purpose is also to teach every one of my students as if they were my own daughter. And that is not easy, because I have a lot of students. I, have, I teach a class that has 300 students in it. They're all undergraduates, and they are needy. I mean, they really do need me. They, they sit out in long lines waiting to come in during my office hours, and I say, how can I help you? And they go, I just want to talk. Go, what do you want to talk about? Well, actually, I'm kind of depressed lately, and I've been on antidepressants, or I'm on anxiolytics, or I'm really having a hard time concentrating, or you know, I broke up with my boyfriend, or whatever it is, or I need a recommendation to med school, or I need this recommendation or that, or whatever, and, and I take all comers. 
And when I do that, it fills my schedule up. And when new students come in and keep doing this, and I get dozens of these requests a week, I go, geez, how do I do this? And I start pressing, you know, re you know reply, and then um, you know, I say, I'm sorry, I don't have time to do this. And then I look at it, and I think about my purpose, and I hit the cancel button. And I go, and I redo the message and say, let's find some time. I have some weekend time. I have some morning, early morning time. I have some evening time. We will find a time to meet because you're my daughter. Every single person is my daughter now. So I decided in thinking about this that I needed to write a book. Um, and I started thinking about Viktor Frankl as I wrote this book. Like, what would Viktor Frankl do in terms, you know, there's so much scientific evidence that Viktor Frankl didn't have. He went through his own horrendous experience. I've gone through my own experiences, but now I have the benefit of all this science. But I also have a public who has an attention span of a mosquito who needs to listen to this, right? So I decided, rather than writing a book like this, Man's Search for Meaning, and rather than having some sort of uh, therapy, which he created called logotherapy or meaning therapy, I thought, you know what, I'm going to write a new book, but I'm going to write it as a graphic novel. So that's what I did. And the reason I wrote it as a graphic novel is that I want people to be able to read it in an hour and a half or less. So I can tell the whole story I really want to tell. I spent four years writing this book because how to compress it, it's really hard to write something in a graphic or in a comic book format, actually, and convey everything I wanted to convey. It has 30 pages of notes in the back because I just couldn't help myself. I said, well, here's a scientific article supporting this. Here's this study. Here's Seneca, blah, blah, blah. He said this, whatever. But I had to write this as in a way that could be easily digested by the vast majority of the public. So that's, that's what I did. And also, I decided I needed a sage in my story. So I worked with a Hollywood screenwriter as I was writing this, and he said, so do you know what sages are? Because I'd read something by Joseph Campbell that you need a sage in your journey. So I said, I said no, not really. He said, who's the sage here? And he showed me this picture. Who is the sage here? Yoda, this little troll doll over here. I mean, he's like this disgusting little thing. And, and, you know, that's fine. He is Luke Skywalker's sage, his oracle. Who's the sage here? An insect. An insect is the sage. I thought, wow, okay, so if Disney can have a, an insect as a sage, maybe I can too. So I started looking around. I was at the British Museum in London, and I started looking at this ancient cartouche that was actually 3,500 years old. And I saw a couple of these scarabs that seemed to be pushing suns up over castle walls that I kind of regarded, oh, that's like the ego. And I thought, whoa, that's so cool. And I, I started thinking more about this image. And it turns out that this scarab god is named Kepri. Kepri is the scarab god, and he's the number one god in ancient Egypt. This is pretty awesome stuff, by the way. So number one God, and do you know what he represents? Anybody? Rebirth, transformation, and transcendence. I'll give you an example. This is a, a real um, hieroglyph of the scarab God. It just seemed, for one thing, to represent my time on the lake when the sun suddenly came up. And that was the idea. The scarab God would push the sun up every morning out of darkness, which they called chaos. Think about chaotic events happening, you know, from what I've just described to you in my own journey to many of the chaotic events that you've had in your journey. This is actually the model for the scarab god, the dung beetle. Can you believe it? That the model for the scarab god was the dung beetle. And just to show that, the family name of the dung beetle is Scarabidae. Can you imagine these ancient Egyptians? They're on the desert floor, and they're looking at these dung beetles pushing this giant, these balls forward. And by the way, they push them in totally perfect straight lines, hundreds of yards, come hell or high water. Can you imagine these guys going, wow, that's kind of cool. He's pushing this giant ball of shit forward. It's amazing. <laughs> Let's make him our number one god. <laughs> How did they do that? Why? Why did they make a dung beetle their number one god, Kepri, in charge of rebirth and transformation? I'll give you a hint. This is the genus name of this dung beetle, Sisyphus. Who knows about Sisyphus? Sisyphus is the person who rolled the ball up, the boulder up every day, only to have it roll back down. That's pretty amazing. Now, this wasn't an Egyptian um, story. This is a Greek story. But nonetheless, 
It's so fascinating that they must have seen this, this almost futile effort pushing this dung ball forward all the time. So he, you know, Sisyphus would do this only to have it roll back down. And we all regarded this as the curse. You know, they cursed him by having the ball roll back down every single day. What a horrible thing. Albert Camus, who was an existential philosopher, a French existential philosopher, wrote a book called The Myth of Sisyphus. By the way, when did he write this? He wrote it when the Nazis were invading Paris. And he was living in Paris while he wrote The Myth of Sisyphus. Pretty amazing. He also was in the French Resistance. So here's what he said in the last two sentences of the myth of Sisyphus. He said, the struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. What is that saying? To me, in the biggest existential you know, universe, we have one sun here that our Earth revolves around. That sun is part of three billion suns in what's called the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a universe that's part of over one billion universes. We are pretty insignificant. Whatever purpose we think we have probably is fairly insignificant, right? So what, Albert Camus is saying? We can be happier if we have a self-transcending purpose in our lives. Whether it really is significant, whether there is a God or not, I'm not going there, but you just decide for yourselves. If you have a stronger purpose, it's important. That's what Albert Camus is saying. By the way, here is a dung beetle, actually. Aren't they cute? These, by the way, you know the alternative to dung beetles for getting rid of dung? Flies. People love these things. This is better. I can, I can guarantee it. So this is what happens. A dung beetle actually does a headstand on top of their ball that they've just rolled, uh, that they just put together. They you know, create this beautiful ball, and then they release a pheromone. They toot out this little pheromone um, you know, from their butt as, as they're doing this headstand. And then all these female dung beetles come running up, and they go, nice ball. Wow. <laughs> and they're really, what they're doing is actually looking at the sphericity of the ball, if you ask biologists, the quality of the sphericity of the ball. Why? Because here's what happens. This dung beetle just finished his nice dung ball. Here's another dung beetle going, nice ball. I think it's mine now. <laughs> this happens in New York every once in a while, doesn't it? So in other words, you have to really protect. Sorry, I'm from the Midwest. You know, it's safe. Um, so anyway, these guys have to really protect their dung ball from dung beetle robbers. I think this is so awesome. Here's another huge thing. Dung beetles actually navigate and are the only insect known to mankind now to navigate according to the stars. They actually navigate according to the Milky Way. Isn't that amazing? I just love these things. Here's another key thing and the reason why I really picked dung beetles for my sage. Because they're literally born into poop. And so are some of us. <laughs> Poop happens to us, right? You know, shit happens. If you fly in, into Mumbai, you see, as you're flying in, you see these huge, huge mountains of garbage. And you see children running through and sorting through the garbage to find their food. They're born into shit, unfortunately. Dung beetles create a purpose out of that. They find a way to generate a purpose. Whether it's important or not, who cares in a big existential way? It's important that you have a big transcending purpose. So I love these things. And I decided to create my sage called Winston. So Winston and I, by the way, have um, a blog, regular blog on the HuffPo. It's very nice. Um, and the whole idea behind this is what we keep talking about in the blog and what I talk about in my book is the importance of having this purpose, almost like a root system, and, and living your life in accordance with that purpose. So the closer your life is lived to that purpose, the happier you'll be, the better off you'll be health-wise. I also decided, you know, Viktor Frankl created logotherapy, where people had to go in and sit on a sofa or sit in a chair and talk with a psychotherapist for like 10 years, talking about your purpose in life and your meaning. Would you do that now? Nobody does that anymore. I mean, very few people. So I thought, okay, some people may. But in general, people don't sit and talk to a psychotherapist for 10, 20 years sitting on a couch or whatever. It's cool. It's just not modern, all right? So what would the postmodern Viktor Frankl do? Well, he'd probably create a website and a blog on the HuffPo, right? He'd create, rather than Man's Search for Meaning, he might create a graphic novel. And here, in this program, 
we actually have an app that allows you first to choose what your core values are. And you can look at these core values yourself. What do you think of those core values? Which are yours? Pick out three. Which ones are most important to you? So you can pick whatever you want in this app. And if you go, by the way, to dungbeetle.org, yes, D-U-N-G-B-E-E-T-L-E.org, it's a not-for-profit foundation that I created called dungbeetle.org. And in dungbeetle.org, we allow you to go ahead and take this app. The app is totally free as well. We have over 4,000 people using it now. It's really awesome. And so you get to pick, like, how deeply held are those values for you? And then once you've done that, and by the way, if you want, you can visit the Grim Reaper, too, and decide what you'd like on your headstone. I have my students do this, and they go, oh, gross, that's so gross. And then they do it, and they go, wow, I actually am thinking more about my purpose in my life. So thinking about death, death is life's change agent, as Steve Jobs said. It starts getting you to think more about your purpose, not morbid at all in a way. So we ask people to start writing in their purpose, and once they've done that, then every single day, it takes 20 seconds or less to just indicate how closely did I live my life in accordance with my purpose, and then every single day, how well did I sleep? How present was I or mindful? How physically active was I? How creative was I, and how well did I eat? On the basis, and then by the way, you're able to journal what you did that day that led to this activity. So for me, when I did this on February 8th of this year, I said, well, you know what? I had some really neat meetings with my students, and that made me feel very in touch with my purpose. In addition, it allows you then to go and take a look at how you've been living your life. So over time, you can take a look at how you're living your life in accordance with how well you slept, how present, how active, how creative, and how well you've been eating. And after 10 days of taking this app, it can tell you, oh, you know what? For you, Vic, living creatively is most related to your alignment. But for other people, it might be being physically active. For others, it's how much sleep they're getting. So this is really intended to help you become a better researcher and help you become a better philosopher of yourself. Socrates said an unexamined life is not worth living. We help you do that. Somebody sent me this little comic a few months ago. You need to find a purpose in your life. I tried, but it's not coming up on my iPhone. Well, now it is, you stupid little punk. So <laughs> it is, and it's free. If you go to iTunes, you can get it, the iPhone app. If you have an Android, you can use it. It's web-enabled. You can go to the website, dungbeetle.org, OK? The app is called On Purpose, if you're interested at all in trying it out. So just to close up. Um, I am still a boiling frog, um, but with my daughter, who's given me a purpose, I'm able to continue walking through life. We all have issues in our lives, and we all sometimes stumble, but if we have a stronger purpose, it gives us a direction that we can keep moving forward in. My own purpose, as I said, is, um, is very big and I need a lot of energy. That's why I think about space. I try to sleep as best I can. I try to be more present. By the way, I meditate every day. And I started in the beginning of this year meditating every single day without missing any because I said, I am not going to allow myself an alcoholic beverage at the end of the day until I have meditated. <laughs> I am the best meditator you've ever seen now. So there's only one time, this is true, there's only one time I actually blew it and I meditated and forgot to drink. So it's not good. <laughs> In the 16th century, the Japanese poet Basho wrote a poem. He wrote, it, it, by the way, Basho is the most famous haiku poet in Japan ever in history. And he wrote his most famous poem. It's called the Frog Haiku, believe it or not. And here's the Frog Haiku. Into the ancient pond, a frog jumps, water sound. What does the ancient pond mean? I'd say that it's our reality. It's our society. That's our ancient pond right now. You can jump, you can jump out of that pot. And it may not make a huge sound, it may make a small sound. But if you make that small sound, if other people make that small sound, if people continue to jump out of their pots of water rather than just boiling, we could change the world together. Thank you. Thank you.